Hello, welcome to another Sunday Science Q&A, 15, 16, 16. 12. I don't know how many we've done that. We've definitely done more than 12. It's probably about the 15th. Uh, and uh, we've been here every Sunday, apart from uh, a couple of Sundays where we did the Sea Shambles uh, at the Albert Hall with an incredible array of guests. And that is still up on YouTube, as is our Cheltenham Science Festival show. Uh, but we've, uh, we've always been here on a Sunday. And uh, in some way or other, today, the subject is predominantly um, oceans and also climate change. We've had a great number of, uh, of questions come in. We're going to rattle through them. Uh, I'll tell you a couple of other things that are going going on as well we have a new series we're doing called genetic shambles uh which is uh, specific conversations with people uh about what we understand uh, uh about uh, the human genome other genomes uh what we need to discover the technology that's changing the first one that goes out is basically has been dealing with uh covid19 uh and uh, how what we're able to do in the 21st century how that has changed from how we would have dealt with a similar situation in you know, even the 1990s 1980s uh etc you can keep going back as far as you want the 1840s the 1720s etc um also the final episode of science in zero g the european space agency series uh which helen uh, and Ginny did uh, that is going out as well and that's looking at the physics of heat transfer in satellites uh show and tell this week will be tuesday night at 8 30 p.m with nish kumar uh josie is doing her show tender tonight live streaming a show uh and also if you can support us of our patreon that is fantastic that's how we're able to make uh uh, very often four five sometimes six seven or eight shows uh, a week is by your support if you can't do patreon and you do have a small amount of spare cash then there's also a tip jar below this screen and that comes in again very very handy we've been using some of that money also to give to art centers and sometimes some of the artists who are struggling now it looks like almost everything is vanquished it is uh, it would be so lovely for me to say panto has been cancelled and for you to retort oh no it hasn't but i'm afraid in a lot of places it has which is also going to have severe ramifications for the arts world so so um, keep an eye on all of your local institutions and see how you can help them if you are able to help them, whether it's with some form of volunteering, if you don't have uh, any spare cash or anything like that. Anyway, so let's get on with today. And uh, I'm going to start with you, Helen, because you've got a show and tell. And you've said that uh, you've run out in all these weeks, all of the different incredible samples that you've shown us. Uh, you have now run out of science. So I haven't actually run out, but I did find this yesterday and I... It, it just makes me laugh every time I see it. So I thought I would show it to you. There is a science point behind it. Um, and it's it's two things, but this is one of them. Can you read that? That's great. I like so it. So I was in, so what it says is it's the annual Hawaiian Scottish Festival. And I was wandering around um, Hawaii a while ago. You know, I had a day when I wasn't doing Hawaiian cultural things. And I came across this group of people out in a park and I had stumbled across the Hawaiian Scottish Festival and I've seen a lot of weird stuff in my life. I have very rarely seen anything that just made me think I had landed in a parallel universe because there were people with Hawaiian flowers and kilts doing combinations of Celtic dancing and Hawaiian dancing. And they had there is a there is a Hawaiian tartan. They had uh, children's, there's a, they also had, so they had um, various um, societies there. And this is one of my favourites down the bottom there. Oh, yes, the Society, Society of Creative Anachronism. <laughs> but they genuinely had this massive Scottish Hawaiian mashup thing. And I was wandering around going, I don't understand. Can someone please, please explain this? And they said that it's because the Scottish were really good shipbuilders. And so, um, you know, perhaps 100 years ago, maybe a bit further, fur further back than that, uh, the Hawaii being right in the middle of the Pacific is obviously, you know, if you want to fix your ship, you don't want to come all the way home to Scotland. So what they did was basically loads of Scottish people were basically imported to Hawaii to fix people's ships and to build ships. And so there is this weird colony almost little mini colony of scottish people still in hawaii and so first of all it just makes me laugh because i i i just they oh and the scottish the, the hawaiian kilt they have a special dispensation so it can be cotton and not wool which is obviously heavy good suited for the weather but it but the point really is about um human migration and cultural mix-ups that we assume that human migration was something that happened a thousand years ago or ten thousand years ago which of course it did but it's only relatively recently that it stopped being you know, we assume there's so much now it doesn't really matter, but actually you don't have to go back very far before people did, you know, a community was transported and lived on the tropical island and carried on being Scottish. And I just think it's brilliant. So I was wanted to show it to you. 
Well, did there, were there any bagpipe bag bag cover versions of Elvis Presley? Because of course, Aloha from Hawaii, I think, is still the most watched. Yes, I mean, uh, it was the whole, yes, that everything bagpipes and Hawaiian things all in the same place at the same time. And if you were going to pick two cultures who you would say were quite, you know, if you're going to pick the stereotype, you would put them at opposite ends of whatever spectrum of any of this stuff, and they just jammed it all together and there's a they had you know children the children's area had the hawaiian word for children and the bands it was like the bear i think it's um kiki kiki the word for the hawaiian word for children but they had the kiki and bands corner and uh, yeah it worked they were they were all terribly happy it is it feels very much like an opening scene from a 60s tv series like uh time tunnel or the twilight zone this kind of rod sign picture a man a scottish man a scottish man with a clan but this scottish man with a clan is going to wake up on an island a very different island to the one he imagined in the twilight zone anyway i will be making that at some point uh as an animation i imagine uh that was wonderful thank you very much the uh now let's find out i think everyone else has got some other form of uh, bagpipe uh enthusiasm to show with their show and tales um tams in next up tams and Edward to uh, many uh, people, many for, people wonderful uh, were incredibly good uh, articles filled with uh, information very comprehensible very sharp the the last one that I read was about a week ago the Friday before last in the Guardian uh, which was just a, a great summary of, of a kind of understanding climate weather what is going on and why sometimes things that can seem paradoxical if you just think hey it's just going to get hotter it's just going to whatever that how in fact it's a lot more complex that's basically what a lot of your articles are saying is yes. i think you'll find it's a lot more complex than that um so uh tamsin of course you were with us a few weeks ago with uh uh dallas campbell and and dot brown as well uh we're talking about conspiracy theories but you have something for us uh today what's your today show? what's your show and tell well, those of you who saw me on the previous Cosmic Shambles and Sea Shambles will notice that I've got a different background today and I don't have uh, Dallas Campbell's uh, spacesuit, the Neil Armstrong replica in the background, and that's because I'm down um, staying at a, in a place in Hastings by the sea, and I'm really pleased to be back by the sea. So um, I, uh, I forgot I had to do a show and tell, but I just realised I've got this really nice photograph uh, that I took yesterday on the beach and I wanted to actually ask um, Kerry about it. So I went walking down on the pebble beaches, the sort of shingle, and I went on a long blustery windy walk and there was this, um, I noticed uh, up on the shingle there was this very long and macabre but rather beautiful line of dead animals basically, mostly crab. Um, and some really quite big ones, uh, a few other bits and bobs. And then most of the other things were this particular type of fish or ray, uh, sort of skeletal or semi-skeletal. And there were just such beautiful colours and, as I say, quite macabre, but quite beautiful. So I thought I'd see if we could ID what this is. That's the underside of it. It's got sort of funny sucker things and a long tail. I've got a picture of the top side, although it's a bit eaten. How big was it? Uh, it was about the uh, one and a half um, of my palm width, like that, probably, like, probably about that long. Ooh. Is that any any good? What about the top side? Would that help? No, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it just looked like a sort of, just looked like a sort of amazing kind of slightly spiky ray oh, monster. Yeah. So that looks a bit like a thorn bat. I mean, it's very small, so maybe it's a juvenile. But um, yeah, yeah. So the main body of it was about that big, but there were several of them. Yeah, it's got the patterning of a thorn bat gray, yeah. um, which is a lovely, lovely beast actually, and, and grows quite large. But that's a um, very small one. <laughs> it was wonderful, and it was just all these sort of tangled, these sort of tangled legs and and crabs with um, holes in their shells, um, sort of piled up on top top of each other, and lots of those with their sort of strange suckers. A few cuttlefish, obviously, um, and it was just beautiful. And I just thought. You know, it's so nice being a, a sea level rise scientist down by the sea and thinking about the interactions of the of the sea with the coast and the tides and how how vast that ocean is, how how I try and study it at completely global scale, but how hard it is to then get down to that tiny local scale of the of the thornback ray ending up on uh, Hastings Beach. I suppose the big question is, uh, uh, has the three separate courses Crazy Golf been able to open during this social distancing time? Unfortunately, I forgot to check yesterday. But oh, I'll man. That's the one my, reason we had you on was because I always like to have someone. for 8.30 tomorrow morning. 
Good, because it's, it's a fantastic three, three. courses, Mayan, Para, and traditional crazy golf. It, it's great. And incredible dusks in Hastings as well. I, I, I'm not entirely sure why, particularly there. I've been there on a few occasions where, you know that point where you go, I think the sun's too big. It's coming towards us. It has an incredible the kind of... Uh, the extremely big. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. Um, we're also joined by... Uh, you, you, you've met her already with the... Was it Thornyback or Thornback? Thornback. Thornback, brilliant. That is uh, Kerry Howell, who is associate professor of marine uh, ecology uh, at Plymouth University, and you've got a show and tell as well. I have, um, yeah. Unfortunately, all my really cool looking stuff is locked in my office at work. Um, but I did find this, which is a rock. I, I know it looks fairly boring. It is a rock, but the rock comes from a a, a sea mount uh, in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean. Um, and it's an oceanic island called Tristan da Cunha. You may have heard of it. It's actually a UK overseas territory. But what Tristan da Cunha is, is an underwater mountain, uh, the top of which pokes out of the out of the water and people live on it. Um, there's a, about 300 people live on Tristan da Cunha. Um, but it's the bit, it's the rest of it underwater that I love um, because sea mounts are just this incredible habitat. They're found throughout the world's oceans and they're home to just the most diverse range of beasties that you will see, including deep sea coral reefs, huge great sea fans, um, sponge gardens. I mean, they're, they're just outstanding. And so even though this little rock looks a little bit rubbish, it's what it represents and it's what it's from that, that I really love. See, and that's what we want when we're talking, we want about, when we're talking about islands in the middle. Of, we we want that, and not not your flyers about the bagpipe festival of Hawaii. You were um, there, in there, Robin. You would have brought back all of the Scottish Hawaiian cultural crossover books, all of them. I, I promise. You. I would have done as well. I know it's a terrible thing. This is uh, that was the my, that was the my, my one quick show and tell. I bought this uh, uh, the other day from Somnium Books, and uh, thirty one pounds fifty, including postage, because I needed. The Psychic World of Plants by Hans Holzer. Does a carrot scream when it's uprooted? Do plants feel pain, fear, love? Can they communicate emotions? How do you listen to a plant? How do they feel about being eaten? A pyramid book. Um, I won't show it to Brian Cox. That'll annoy him. Um, but I think there's going to be a lot of fun. Came out in the 70s. That won't surprise you, will it? Um, so we have a huge number of questions today. We're going to try and get through um, all of them. And uh, we're going to start off with Lana. Uh, Lana's question is, is there any technology around that can use the motion of the ocean to generate clean power? So should I start? Yes, Tamsin, start with you. Oh, I think Helen was just talking about... Oh, I'm sorry, uh, your nodding was very believable, and therefore yeah, I, I imagine not... you were actually nodding in relief that Helen had the answer. <laughs> Helen, <laughs> Helen. <laughs> and, well, there's one of the interesting things about the ocean, that there's no doubt there's lots of energy there, but it's quite hard to get at it. And fundamentally, that's because in order to access energy, you need there to be a difference in energy. You need a hot and a cold thing next to each other, or you need something to be moving next to something that is staying still. And one of the problems with getting energy out of the ocean is that although it is the battery of Earth when it comes to energy... It's all very even. So the energy that is accessible is sort of little bits around the edges. So there, so it makes it difficult because you have to find a place where there's a difference in order to get any energy. So a few things have been proposed. Um, the, you know, we're away, aware of tidal energy, which doesn't work everywhere. Like living in the UK, we have very high tides compared with most of the world. And we tend to forget that. Tidal energy works near coasts mostly. Um, it's complicated because... It tends to be in shallow places where there are things living and it can cause problems. But tidal energy does that. I think all of Orkney actually is powered by marine re, marine renewables. Um, so wave energy, you can get energy out of it. But again, it's hard. You have to anchor something and, and you know, it's not the most efficient process. So and then there are the other the, the, the one thing that has been proposed that would be hard to scale up, but certainly in theory is a very, very large source of energy is a place. I've actually been to one of the places in the world where they're trying to do this. Um, and it was in Hawaii, just around the corner from the Hawaiian Scottish Festival. Um, but the, way, the, the structure of the ocean is it's got a warm lid and it's got cold water underneath. And so there you have a difference. You've got warm water on top and cold water underneath. 
And this place, uh, you, you, if you pump those two water sources out, you then have hot and cold water and you can extract energy from that. Now, it's only efficient if you have a really big difference. So it would only ever work in the tropics where you've got 30 degree surface water and four degree subsurface water. Um, otherwise, it's not worth doing. And and so for small islands, you could do that, but it's not you can't really scale it up. It doesn't work. So if you were a small island, you have few other sources of energy, apart from solar power, perhaps. It might be useful. It's reliable. It doesn't depend on the weather. Um, but it's, you, you can't scale it up because you need a bigger temperature difference than the ocean provides in most places. So it's really frustrating that the ocean is absolutely full of energy. But because there aren't differences right next to each other, it is surprisingly hard to extract Tamsin, I'm going to admit you've got the next question, uh, uh, which is, uh, this is from Jonathan. Jonathan would like to know, is there confidence in paleoclimate research, even, or rather, is, is the confidence in paleoclimate research even slightly dented by the fact that the recent paper by Kaufman et al. used borehole temperature reconstruction back to front interchanging modern and historic values? And I know that's very specific, but I thought it's the kind of specific that you're going to be on, be on top, top of with, with this one. Uh, yes. Hi, Jonathan, if you are watching. I know Jonathan. Um, I haven't read that. So Jonathan is talking about um, criticisms of a specific paper or pair of papers, which I haven't read up on. So I think I can't comment specifically on what has happened, whether there's been a data error. Um, you know, I'd need to look into that more detail. And I'm sorry, I haven't done that before this. Um, I think that on a kind of a broader point of how we know about the past, you know, I'm interested in how we try and reconstruct um, past climates and how we try and learn something from that. And I think in a way it's both, uh, sorry, this is going to be my classic answer, much better and much worse in a way um, than we might think. So it's there's something, I think the general kind of knowledge of how much we know about past climates um, we don't lots of people in the in the public wouldn't necessarily hear stories of how we how we reconstruct past climates and the amazing ways in which we can learn something about the past from you know fossilized bits of pollen and stick and things from old plants to see what kind of climate they were living in in the past um one of my favorite ones is the pack rat midden so the pack rat um i think it's in northern america uh, eats vegetation and things and then leaves all its bits in a in a pile at the back of its cave and then wheeze on them and that preserves them and you end up with this pile of vegetation and leaf bits that can be thousands hundreds or thousands of years old um mosquitoes buried in lakes or non-biting midges um tree rings people might know people might know ice cores from antarctica and and greenland um and that's just not even the half of it. Stalagmites and stalagmites, uh, stalagmites and stalactites you can chop up um, and look at a bit like tree rings as well. And, you know, way too many different ways to, to mention of how we can try to look at these indirect measures of past climate to work out how different it was in the past compared with today. Can we reproduce that with our climate models? And... So in a way, so that's the way in which things are much better than we might think. You know, people might not know that incredible richness of um, detective work that paleoclimate scientists are doing with these incredibly subtle measures of the past of rainfall and, and temperature and things. Um, what's difficult then is, is how precise you can be because these are often really, really broad measures and how much you can learn about whether that change was um, whether our climate change today is unprecedented, um, or our, you know, how good are our climate models at reproducing that? And that, so the devil is, is really in the detail and it can be difficult. There have been um, challenges in paleoclimate research of figuring out what the error bars are on the past or figuring out what the relationships are between the past climates and these indirect indicators. It's a really challenging subject. Um, and trying to understand how we can learn from that is, a, is an ongoing process. So, yeah, I mean, my, my general point about paleoclimates is there's a lot to learn, but it's an incredible, um, rich and creative science that I think not enough people know about. So that's my uh, half critical, half optimistic perspective. Thank you. I mean, is that generally a, a, a problem quite often with what one, if one wants to say, the, the, the dogmatic uh climate denialist area um mm. that uh, it requires one paper with an error and then that's ah therefore i mean much in the same way that we've seen in other forms of denialism once you've got the one paper you you, you can entirely ignore the 500 others that might have come out recently and you just hold up that piece of paper 
And it does seem that sometimes, you know, people like me who are not, uh, you know, versed in, 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 in properly in, in, in the way of science, I might read a paper, uh, but because I don't know the entire environment that surrounds it of all the other research i can just go ah i found my truth yeah you, you do, you do get, get that you do get people using specific mistakes that have happened as happens across science you know as a gotcha moment for climate science and you also get people saying um you know if the past climate change wasn't that different uh wasn't that much colder than today then it can't possibly be that we're changing the climate now for example there's sort of logical errors around um what how we actually learn how much recent climate change is done to humans that's much more done with recent um observations which obviously are much more precise than paleoclimate indirect reconstructions and climate models which is a, diff a different area of science um, to these tree ring type methods and so on. So I think, yeah, there's a lot of scrutiny and a lot of attention, a lot of gotcha-ing. But I think also there's an environment in science where it can be really difficult to admit mistakes. Um, you know, science, most areas of science are tremendously complicated in terms of, you know, larger and larger data sets, bigger and bigger collaborations, more and more pressure to get the big papers out in the big journals um, several a year, um, you know, to kind of this kind of treadmill. And it doesn't apply to in every area of science, but it, it can be that then difficult to actually spend another six months or a year checking everything or to withdraw a paper that you've actually you know relied on for your work just emotionally as a human that's a difficult thing to do so I have sympathy where there have been you know people have been slow to do that or it's been you know mistakes have been made you know I I worked on um, a paper recently which was the most complicated thing I've done but because of the deadlines of the IPCC report um, I had to do it faster than any analysis I've ever done and luckily actually the deadline was kind of around submitting to the journal and now I have some extra time to reflect and rewrite my code and check and talk to different scientists about the robustness of, of my initial progress but there are these structural pressures on science that can sometimes lead to cracks and, and mistakes you know in every area of science. Thank you. Um, right. Uh, now, uh, Kerry, I, this is uh, from Rose and this is turtle eggs hatch into male turtles when incubated at cooler temperatures and females if incubated at warmer temperatures. Does this mean climate change will lead to a gender imbalance and dwindling turtle numbers? Yeah, well, it's it's certainly one of the worries is that, yes, lots of things in ecology have these sort of very delicate relationships with temperature and turtle eggs are a really, a really good example of that. Um, and, and yes, I mean, it very much determines the, the gender, the temperature that they're incubated at. And if we are going to see increases in, in um, temperature, then there's every possibility that we are going to see those um, those sorts of things happening. But it's not just turtles, of course. I mean, there's there's lots of other species that have very delicate relationships with temperature. Um, indeed, all, all species ranges are shaped by the, the temperature envelope that they live in. And as, as that temperature change occurs, we're going to start seeing um, organisms shifting their ranges north or south. So animals that used to live, you know, in, in in, let's say on our shores um, may find they that, that that sort of temperature is no longer suitable for them and they need to move either north or south depending on um, whether they prefer it warmer or colder um, and so you know we are going to see uh, with with climate change just these huge huge changes in the ecological world and the difficulty is trying to predict what what's going to happen um, and what the knock-on effects of that are going to be, not just for, for biodiversity, but, but also then for all the sorts of services that we get from biodiversity. So another kind of classic example is shifts in fish populations. So we're already seeing shifts in the cod population, they're shifting north. Um, and this means that grounds that people used to fish traditionally are becoming less productive because the, the fish are moving, they're moving, they're not there anymore. Um, and so this is causing hardships for, for people and difficulties in finding catches. So, so there's all sorts of problems that are going to come from climate change that are going to impact on people and how we live and the sort of services we get from the ocean. Um, and I guess our job, uh, particularly as ecologists, is, is to try and 
you know, inform those things and come up with the predictions of what's going to happen, what we think is going to happen based on the best evidence so that we can try to prepare uh, and try to make sure that we're ready for, for what's coming. So is this, so is this, if we could, uh, I know it's going to be a ridiculous question as usual, but because it's from me, not from one of the audience, but the speed of mutation heredity, natural selection, that the ability of certainly of, 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 of larger animals, the, the possibility to adapt to that change is we're moving too fast for that, that speed of adaption. Yeah. That, that's right, yeah. Um, and so so organisms are able to adapt um, and they're also able to acclimate. So even so, within their own lifetime, if they're born under certain conditions, they can acclimatise to different sets of conditions, but only within a certain envelope. And then beyond that, there's, it, it, it's sort of lethal. So, so then you're down to... Um, adaptation then over evolutionary timescales but that that's a really slow process and the change is just happening really rapidly and it's it's too fast for adaptation uh, to be able to keep pace with it and that's the problem really that we're facing thank you the thank you. uh the uh next question from uh, mark dean quinn thank you for uh, watching again mark um do you feel that if the amount of money spent on space exploration was spent on ocean exploration, we would be equally inspired by what we discovered? And I'm going to go straight to Helen for that one. Um, so it, it, is, it has been said by many, many climate scientists when looking at the amount of money that went into the Apollo program, for example, that um, if we just spent that money looking after Earth, we'd be in a much better place. I've got very mixed feelings about this. So I have been, for, you know, for the BBC interview, I've interviewed a lot of scientists and they, you always have this bit where I'm left to chat at them at the start to get to know them a bit before we start filming. And it is definitely true in my experience that a very high proportion of people within about a 20 year age range, when you ask, how did you end up doing this? They said, well, I watched Apollo and I wanted to be an astronaut, but actually I've ended up doing fish ecology. Um, so, so there was an inspiration in that, um, that you can't deny, I think, whether or not going to space was the aim. It was the idea that science was full of inspiring, fun things to go out and do. I think I have no doubt that if people had looked into the ocean, they would have found amazing things. But we have this problem as oceanographers that you can't see into the ocean the way you can see into the sky. And if I could invent a thing that was entirely unphysical, I would invent a pair of binoculars that let you look down into the ocean the way you could look up into the sky. Um, so, so I definitely think inspirational things would have been found. However, I do think that there is a thing in the human psyche that likes the untouchable. It likes the thing where you can imagine and you can't be told you're wrong. And the problem with the ocean is that to some extent, we've still got a mystery in the deep ocean, lots of it, the sort of stuff Kerry studies. But it's never going to be as fun to a human because you can go there and be proved wrong. Whereas people can look at the stars and imagine what they like and, you know, imagine all the little aliens with the green things, you know, little green antenna or whatever. Um, so I, but I think there, I'm going to say one more thing and then I'll shut up, which is that the, the, but the problem we have is that we had an opportunity to redefine exploration and we didn't do it. Apollo fixed, all right, Apollo was like the end of the colonial era of exploration. And what we do is we go somewhere, we plant the flag, and then we own it. And that's all we need to know about it. And we need to redefine our definition of exploration to understanding process, not just it's there, we've drawn a map, and now we're going to clear off. But this is how it works. This is the machine we're sitting inside. And, and the opportunity is with the ocean to redefine what exploration is. We, we're not going to do that nearly as much with outer space because, frankly, just getting there is such an achievement. Um, but if we can redefine understanding exploration as understanding process, which is fascinating and so rich, and get away from this idea that once we've been there, there's nothing to know about it, then we have an opportunity. So I think Inspiration can come from the ocean, but we need to redefine exploration very consciously to go with it. And it's not an artificial thing. It is absolutely a valid change of thinking. It's just we, we need to do it as a culture and get away from colonial exploration. Well, as we're on exploration, uh, Kerry, this is from Colin. Uh, he, uh, he says, uh, Twitter got very excited the other week about how we'd now mapped one fifth of the ocean floor. My question is, why only one fifth? And also, what is the major benefit of knowing just the topography without images of life, temperatures, etc.? Et oh, right. Yes. Well, um, the reason it's so small is, is um, partly um, from what Helen just said, is that it's, it's really difficult to see the sea floor. So we do that using sound. We use acoustics to uh, like echo sounders, I guess, 
to, to map the sea floor. And that's incredibly time consuming. You have to have a ship that goes out and basically goes up and down in a sort of mow the lawn pattern. Uh, and that gives us a shape of what the sea floor looks like. Um, and, it, and it is expensive and it's time consuming. And so that's why we've only mapped a very small proportion of the sea floor. Um, and, um, you know, I, I obviously favour seeing the animals uh, as well as, as knowing the shape of the seafloor. But just knowing the shape of the seafloor is really, really important because all of our oceanographic models are based on bathymetry. That is the shape of the seafloor. So we need to have accurate maps of that to understand what the oceanography is doing uh, and be able to model that. Um, but also when, when we try to... Um, understand the kinds of animals that live on the seafloor, we're, we're also modelling. So sometimes we're basing our predictions of what animals are going to be where on the seafloor on the basis of the terrain. Um, and if we don't have decent terrain maps, we can't make those predictions of what we think is going to be there based on what we know is in other places that are similar. So, so those topographic maps of the seafloor are absolutely essential. And I'm, I'm always fascinated by the fact that the people don't realise that the map that you see of the sea floor, if you get your, you know, your Google Earth or whatever, and you're looking at, you know, what you think is the map of the seabed, that that's a model. It's not real. It's it's based on really, really coarse data. Um, and, and this is always hammered home to me when I'm working on sea mounts. So we'll go to a place because we want to look at an underwater mountain. Um, we were doing this very recently around St. Helena in the South Atlantic. And we went to a sea mount. And we thought the seamount was uh, 200 metres, the top of it was 200 metres below the surface, right? That was the shallowest point. Um, and when we multi when we used our acoustic data to go across it and actually map the seamount, the, the, the sea you know, the summit was 2,000 metres deep. So we were out by a huge amount. So our, our models of the sea floor are really quite bad, um, but they're the best we have, and that's what we work with for now. Uh, but um, but yeah, it, it's it's a real challenge. But but we hope over the next decade. So there is this program called uh, Seabed 2030, which is part of the UN Decade of Ocean Science, which is starting in January next year and will run for the for the whole decade. Um, there is this plan to try to map. Uh, the world's oceans and not just the topography but also the animals and the oceanography and, and all aspects of mapping uh, of the oceans and that's a really exciting prospect and I think we're all going to be very busy for the next 10 years um, but uh, yeah I mean it's it, it's a it's a real challenge um, and and actually one of our, our colleagues calculated how much it would it would cost to map the seafloor and it was the cost of the, the Mars mission, the recent, at the time, it was the Beagle mission. And it was it was pretty much the same cost of a, as a Mars mission to map the whole of the seafloor. Um, and uh, yeah, so I thought that was interesting. It's, it's really about, do, do you want to invest in that? And there are, there are very good reasons why you should. Can I just add something, which, which is, is something that people don't think about with the ocean floor? And this is something that scientists are only just starting to appreciate that, you know, Kerry's talking about the lumps and bumps that are down here on the bottom. And one of the most important um the things we need to understand in what the ocean does for climate is how it's mixed in different places. So the ocean generally is quite separate. It's not like one big pond that's all the same. We have this warm layer at the top. We have distinct layers underneath. It's actually really hard to, to mix ocean water up because you don't have, have a giant teaspoon that's kind of, you know, mixing everything up. So if you want to calculate when things go down into the ocean, do they stay down? Can they get to different animals? All of that kind of stuff. You need to understand how the ocean mixes. And one of the things that is very true that is if, if the ocean, you know, if you have currents coming along sideways and you meet one of these little sea mounts that Kerry was talking about, just the process of having that little bump mixes up the ocean. It is like a teaspoon in the ocean. So if you imagine you're trying to, you know, um, make a cake or something, and but you can only mix with a little spoon in lots of places, it's probably a bit of a rubbish analogy, but you know what I mean? It's it, that idea of how well mixed the ocean is, is absolutely just about the shape of the ocean floor. And it's a really subtle process. But if you want to understand climate impacts and where nutrients go in the ocean and where the stuff is in the ocean, because the stuff is just carried by the water. If you don't mix the water, you don't mix the stuff. Um, you need to know that shape. The details of that shape are actually surprisingly important. important. And, of, and of course, because everything's connected, 
that obviously affects everything that um, that interface between the atmosphere and the ocean. Obviously, that you study, Helen, the the drawdown of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the ocean is part of what's saving us from as much global warming as we would be having if it wasn't doing that, um, uh, but causing the acidification, the pH changes in the ocean, um, which are affecting life. But also the ice sheet. So one of the key areas that we don't understand very well about the future of Greenland and, and Antarctica is their interface with the ocean. You know, we think of that the important thing about Greenland and Antarctica for sea level rise is that they are basically on bedrock. They're on land, if you like. So when the ice melts, it goes into the ocean and causes the sea to rise, whereas if it was floating, it wouldn't. Um, but the so so the but the edges so although they're on land they have edges that touch the ocean, and the way that the the, the details of the way that the ocean circulates in the kind of pockets the fjords and the cavities under the ice shelves how those warm bodies of water get you know dragged and pulled in towards the ice sheet or don't uh, has a huge impact on our predictions for the future of both Greenland and Antarctica and again we don't necessarily know even the detail of the of that bathymetry of that of that ups and downs of the bed of the ocean even in those important bits around the ice sheets because of course the polar regions are kind of difficult to get to but also the the problems that you talked about before well, thank you very much for that question, Colin. That was a very useful question. A um, uh, question from Ali now. Um, I'll start with you on this, Tamsin. This is, has the bleaching of corals gone past tipping point? Are some reefs now just dead and gone forever, ever? Well, I think I should I should really defer to Kerry because that's on the on the coral side of things. I mean, I can quickly say on the climate side, you know, the, the things that are a problem for coral, unfortunately, are... are uh, a multitude you know there's the warming there's the ph changes that i just mentioned potentially kind of storminess as well as the human impacts obviously of, of pollution and, and unsustainable kind of use of resources and unfortunately um you know we are expecting the temperatures to keep going up and the ph to keep going down um and exacerbating those problems and and it's certainly one of the most dramatic predictions of climate change impacts that i talk about to students and, and people is is the near certainty with which scientists are predicting that just the little bit of temperature shift that we get, even if we keep to the Paris Agreement of one and a half or two degrees of warming, could um, could have these extinction effects, which I'll, I'll pass over to Kerry. But it's, it's very hard to avoid those impacts from a climate point of view because they happen at very short term amounts of warming, basically just a little bit more than where we are now. No, I, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you've, you've, you've said it all that, that, that coral reefs are really in a lot of trouble because there's multiple impacts of climate change on them. And it's the temperature rise, it's the, the pH, uh, and it's also the sea level rise as well. They, I mean, they can't grow fast enough to actually avoid the sea level rise problem. Um, so they, they are in a, in a huge amount of trouble. Um, there are efforts going on uh, among ecologists globally to try to find... Um, particularly in, in, in thinking about the bleaching problem now, to try to find um, particular types of, uh, sorry, do you have to kind of explain that you, the cold water, sorry, warm water corals have these algae that live within them, uh, the symbiotic algae, and they're really important to the nutrition of the coral. And so one of the, what, what happens when they bleach, so they, they give the coral their color and when they bleach, these algae are expelled uh, and the coral can't get enough energy then because they, they're getting energy from these algae uh, and then they die. Um, but so, so what ecologists are trying to do in some parts of the world, there are these algae that are um, much more resistant to high temperatures they're better adapted to high temperatures and they're found so places like the Red Sea where the temperature is really very high um, you can get these strains of algae that are particularly resistant to high temperatures and so there's work going on in trying to look at getting corals to uptake the more resistant uh, algae so that will help give them a defense uh, against bleaching or give, make them more resilient to bleaching um, and there's lots of work on, on trying to regrow uh, corals in areas where they're threatened by other other things aren't helping. So, you know, on top of climate change, you've got problems like eutrophication of fishing and all kinds of other impacts that, that really aren't helping an already stressed system. So there are things we can do. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, 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 they really are under a lot of threat and coral reefs is, is looking quite a serious problem. Problem. Am I right that there's, Am I um, right that there's, um, there's, there's some, some kind of, of uh, 
human nudged migration, if you like. You talked about um, species that can move with climate change will. Obviously, coral like trees can't move very quickly or, you know, by sort of seeding off their little, I don't know enough about coral to know what they're called, but, you know, sort of dispersing. But am I right that some, I, I had a coral scientist say that uh, you could transport some of these to slightly cooler waters as well, that you could help nudge them to I a better climate. I think they don't do very well. So, so I breeding have... coral is really, really hard and tran you can't transplant, they're all very finicky. Kerry probably knows much more about this, but they, they're very finicky in how they reproduce and the sorts of conditions they're adapted for. So I think even moving coral even sort of 10 miles, it, it doesn't tend to do very well. Am I, am I, I feel like I've heard talks on that, Kerry. Am I right or wrong about that? No, they, they are, they are very difficult. Um, I think they are, they do have, yeah, very specific conditions they like. Um, but I think, you know, the, the, the sort of like the idea of transplanting and, and the sort of that assisted migration is another thing that we can look at to try to mitigate these impacts. Um, but certainly, um, the other thing we can look for actually is is um, areas that are naturally cooler. So we actually have, have a project doing this, which is looking at areas um, where the oceanography is such that you, you get these sort of flushing of areas with cold water. It's part of a process called internal waves. And, and we think um, what happens is you get cold colder water that's deeper. It gets flushed over certain areas because of the um the the shape of the seabed again and the tidal the the influence of the tide and so there are these areas that that, that sort of stay cool um because of the oceanography and those areas are really going to be critical because they're going to be the little pockets where where corals can survive and what we need to do is identify those areas and ensure that we're not putting other pressures on them and that we're protecting them um, from other types of human activity to give them the best chance they have of, of continuing to exist in these little pockets. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Ali, for that question. The uh, just reminder when it was reminder when it we've still got time for a few more questions. But don't forget uh, Helen's series that she did with uh, Ginny Smith about the European Space Agency and all of the well, no, it's not about the European, but it is there. Uh, go and have a look at that. That's uh, we've got the final episode of that coming up. Uh, Josie Long, don't forget, Tender uh, is uh, live tonight. She'll be doing her brilliant show, really uh, a wonderful show. If you have the time this evening, uh, it's probably better than anything that's going to be on television. Um, and also a reminder that if you can support us via Patreon, Patreon, either Cosmic Shambles or Book Shambles, that makes a huge difference to us. Or if you can just leave a, uh, a tip at the, uh, not a tip of your opinion, we don't need that. There's plenty of those. I, I mean a financial tip, not a recommendation of how I should do this. Thank you very much. I'm a professional, well, the nearest they could get. Um, so uh, now it's an undersea copra like question. So I'm going to go for you this, Helen, because of course the Christmas show, uh, there was some, some wonderful, uh, your show and tell, uh, the Christmas show we did last year was great. This is from uh, Enchanted Ham Robot. Um, is it true that blue whale poo creates plankton blooms which add significantly to O2 levels around the world? So this is for those who missed the poo. I did talk quite a lot about whale poo. Um, so one of the, the, the great problem of the ocean, I mean, if you're a living thing in it from a structural point of view before we get to climate change, the problem is that the sunlight is at the top and all the useful building blocks and your nutrients tend to sink. And so what happens, the life that succeeds is, is the life that gets there when both the nutrients and the sunlight are in the same place. And um, so nutrients tend to sink. Whales, depending on the species, feed at depth. And when they come up to the surface to breathe, they also poo. And that poo is basically really good fertilizer. A lot of it is extremely iron rich. And then you've brought your nutrients up to the top where the sunlight is, and then life can get going. So... There have been um, quite a few papers written about marine mammals helping with this process. And one of the difficulties, of course, is that we have got rid of a lot of marine mammals. Humans have hunted a lot of seals and whales and things until they all stressed out the porpoises and dolphins till there aren't as many of them. So this it is tr it is the case that where this it's, it's been given the name the whale pump. Uh, that where this poo, where poo is brought to the surface, you suddenly have both the fertilizer and the sunlight, and that that does that. Yeah, that is the sort of thing that that lets sets life off, um, and so you can extrapolate back to say, well, when the ocean had its the number of whales that you would expect if humans hadn't come along, there is no doubt that this process would have been much more significant. So there might well have been quite a lot more nutrients in some some areas of the upper ocean. So. I've only seen maybe two or three papers on it, so I don't know. I think 
it's it's not i don't know how much how um how much it's people are looking back if you like to see what could have been but it, it definitely works it's definitely true that whale poop and it's also actually true that so people complain or fishermen often complain that seals and whales are competing with them for fish but actually what they're doing is fertilizing the things that feed the fish so if you the more whales and seals you have it's on a broad scale you've probably got more fish so yeah poo fundamentally the thing about poo is that the world is built from poo and if you can make yourself out of poo, you, you're sorted, right? And this is what we forget with the whole recycling thing is it's not about making a thing and then wondering what to do with it afterwards. You've got to start with the poo. If you can make your, if you can, can build, if you can build your society out of the poo of the civilized world, you're good to go. So that's the way to look at all of this stuff. And it's that the ocean, the earth, this is, this is what happens. The energy flows through, the stuff goes round and round. And so um, poo is very, very useful stuff. This, by the way, is why, the way, is uh, why uh, Helen's reworking of the Frankenstein story uh, did not open at the National Theatre. Look, Dr. Pretorius, I've made a man entirely out of poo. Didn't work. Uh, Fecalstein was fun. But uh, we have, I've got to ask this just because uh, we, we uh, uh, Kerry, does the colossal squid exist? The biggest squid <laughs> I've seen, I think, is in the National Museum of, of New Zealand in, uh, um, in, in, in Wellington. It's in Tepapa. Yeah fantastic yep. place no uh, it, it, it does exist it most certainly does exist it's very elusive um we we don't see it often uh, and when we do see it it's it's usually dead or parts of it that come out of the stomachs of sperm whales but um yes i can assure you the colossal squid does exist well that will the, then everything falls also right now also right now what's the slimiest deep sea animal known to date hashtag slime is fun <laughs> um, well, I, I think the slimiest animal in, in the marine environment is, is well known to be the hagfish, which is uh, just incredible at producing slime. It can produce a bucket of slime in under a minute or something. It's, it, it is the slimiest. But, but lots of, on the subject of slime, lots of deep sea beasties are slimy. Um, but there's a very good reason for that. It's a, it's a form of defense. It's a form of protection from predators and disease. So um, lots of the sea cucumbers that live in the deep sea are extremely slimy. Um, as are the starfish. And in, in fact, there's a starfish called the slime star, which is a particularly slimy starfish. But um, yeah, I think the hagfish is the winner. Um, now, this is, um, now, this uh, is from, uh, from Scott. Uh, who's, uh, oh, people often start with maybe a silly question. They're never silly questions. If they come from a place of your general curiosity, there's, they're, they're, it's not a silly question. Um, Scott is just interested that when he was at school, he was told you know, to stop using specific aerosols because of the hole in the ozone layer. In all the current talk about climate change concerns, no one really mentions the hole in the ozone, ozone layer anymore. Is that still an issue or did we fix that? And if so, does that give us some glimmer of hope for fixing the current plop storm? So, uh, Tam's Tam in. Um, unfortunately, the reason we don't talk about it is mainly because we uh, we created a much bigger problem <laughs> to talk about, which is climate change. Um, yeah, the, ho the hole in the ozone layer is still there. It is getting a bit smaller. This is over Antarctica. And it is predicted to probably close up maybe around the 2080s, I think. Um, but there are there are kind of interactions with climate change and the ozone hole, and um, you know, Helen, you may want to, may want to add something. But the uh, the CFCs, the the gases um, that that cause the ozone hole, and the and the HCFCs um, as well are greenhouse gases. In fact, they're ex extremely potent greenhouse gases. So there is a kind of a, an interplay where these things are kind of you know, the same gases that are causing the ozone hole um, or replacing those uh, chemicals are are creating some of the climate change. Um, and there's also kind of interactions where actually the the size of the ozone hole depends a bit on the on the local climate as well. So it depends on the on the temperatures over Antarctica. Basically, that's um, the reason the biggest ozone hole is at the is at the South Pole and there's a a little bit of a trace of that in the North Pole as well is actually because of the cold temperatures. So there are these kind of interesting trade-offs of, of, you know, each making each other worse or sort of better in different ways. I don't know if Helen, but it's, it's a complex kind of system. But it's consistent yeah, it's pieces of the success story. The Montreal Protocol, which was when mm -hmm. the world got together and decided to ban CFCs, is why. I mean, part of the reason it, it, it the hole is still there is it just takes a long time to mend. It's not actually that humans are doing very much. So, so it was widely considered a success. Now, in recent years, 
because of satellites, actually, we, there has been detections of CS, CFCs being produced again. And satellite data, what you can do now is if you see something on the satellite, you can basically stick that onto a weather model and run it backwards to see where it came from, to see where the winds came from. And so we have seen uh, places, industrial sites in China, starting to produce CFCs. But the thing is now that because of the way the satellites work, you can see them. So um, it... it it did demonstrate that the world could work together. And yes, it was one tight set of chemicals, there were alternatives available, but it did happen. So I think that is still a cause for optimism and it is what anyone holds up. Every time anyone says, oh, you'll never get the world to agree. Well, they did once, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but, but it does take a long time to fix these things. And But the good thing is that the sorts of monitoring we have now mean we can see, we can see where it's coming from. So actually, in the past, if you had a factory in the middle of nowhere, you could basically do what you wanted because no one was going to be able to tell. And what we now have is accountability in a way that we have never had. And that is actually one of the biggest um, sources of good news, I think, because all of this is open data. People can look mm -hmm. and you'll get found out. You know, whether the world can stop you doing it is another question, but we, well, we, we definitely know a lot more about who's emitting what. Mm -hmm. Right, we're pretty much out. I've got, oh, pretty sorry. Much out. I've got, oh, sorry. Would someone like to add something? Was I've got such good headphones, I can hear the slightest intake of breath. And my paranoia immediately means that I, I thought there's... Uh, I apologise for the, the questions we haven't been able to... There's, there's quite a few more, but I just wanted to ask... Da Damien wanted to know, he said, I enjoyed Adam Rutherford's How to Argue with a Racist. Can someone please write a How to Argue with a Climate Change Denier? Uh, it's just the usual natural fluctuations in temperature person. Book in time for Christmas, please. So I thought I'd ask you who, your recommendations for... The one that I, I think of, which I think was recommended to me by Simon Singh quite a few years ago, was... Uh, what's the worst that could happen which was a, a i think a u.s uh high school teacher who, who did a few youtube films with his uh class uh just kind of trying to show the how but this this is over 10 years ago it's probably 12 13 years ago so recommendations for apart from when you yourselves have written these books i wonder what you would recommend for people just to kind of introduce them to uh ideas of climate change i can i this is this is a topic I, I think about a lot, and I think there's a lot of resources out there which kind of do the gotcha side. They do debunking, as they call it, and they do the kind of, aha, well, you haven't understood climate change properly if you're saying that, or aha, here's the evidence. And, um, and that's useful in the sense that it's good for people to understand how the kind of climate skeptic type arguments relate to the science and why, you know, why they're not robust um, usually. But uh, they're never useful <laughs> for actually trying to convince a climate skeptic. And uh, absolutely, uh, like they're really interesting to, to read and useful to understand the climate, but they're really not going to change anyone's minds. And the one thing that we, we talked a bit about in the previous Cosmic Shambles with conspiracy theories, um, the one thing that doesn't change minds in this kind of situation um, is giving people more facts, is, is loudspeakering at them. And, you know, the, the thing that I always say, uh, my kind of short answer that I give to this stuff is usually to kind of try and ask that person questions about where they got the information and why, who do they trust and why do they trust this group and this person rather than this group and that person. And it's not necessarily going to help you change their mind either, um, but at least it will help you understand where, how they got to that point. There's a great documentary I just watched the other night. There's a colleague of mine called Chris DeMayer at King's College London, who's a neuroscientist. And he, he made, he produced a documentary um, about the, uh, a group of people, who, Christians, who thought that the world was going to end in May 2011. And they followed them in the run up to that date. Um, and then they interviewed them afterwards. And so it was a very wonderful and empathetic and interesting documentary about how people come to believe views that seem completely incomprehensible to other people. And it talked about a very important concept. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the psychologist who, who published on it, but she's in the program about the, the idea of a pyramid of, of polarization, effectively, where someone can just start at the top very, they could go either way on a the subject. They don't know much about it. They haven't really formed an opinion. Oh, I've sort of heard a bit of this and I've heard a bit of that. Something makes them tip a little bit one way. They talk to someone they trust. They have a conversation. They read something. And the point about the polarization of the pyramid is 
the more you read and the more you talk to people, the more you will affirm your belief that you are right and you will sustain that. And the more that someone challenges you, the more you will entrench in that view that the person you're talking to is wrong or an idiot or has self-interest involved. And the more you go down that point. And so at the end, you have one person over here and one person over here, and we have this massive polarization. So there, so there isn't much hope in changing minds unless you can pull them back out of that with trust with showing something that they they can relate to you that they believe you that they believe the way that you've come to your conclusion is is trustworthy that you share their values that you share some cultural identity with them and that's basically the only way the debunking websites are not going to do anything I, I, I found What's the Worst That Could Happen was quite a useful book, but it probably not to necessarily persuade uh, someone, But it, because I, I don't think it was that brutal in terms of you're an idiot. It felt less like that, because I, I, I think there is something, and I'll be interested to hear from Karen Helen, which is, I know we've talked about this before, Helen, but I, I think if people are on social media, arguing your point is not as useful as just saying, oh, I'm interested you think that, have you read this? To actually get, because the 280 character argument back and forth seems to just have no effect whatsoever but you can quite quickly find out if someone actually has no interest in any other information on that idea if they just refuse to read anything you go well i don't need to, i won't spend any more time here but i have occasionally found telling you things yeah just saying oh i wonder if you have you seen this it's quite interesting to be honest it didn't work with peter hitchens but there we go that was a long long weekend um Helen, I know you've talked, well, Kerry, actually, first of all, because Helen and I have talked about this before, but do, do you have a kind of, any, any system that you sometimes use to just try and say, well, there's another angle to this? I don't, I have to confess, I don't tend to meet climate deniers very often, <laughs> climate change deniers very often. Um, no, but I mean, I, I, I think Tamsin is absolutely right. It's, it's more to do with psychology than anything else. Um, and, and in other situations where I've tried to convince people that, um, well, tried to get someone to think about things from another perspective I, I I think you're absolutely right it's it's about asking questions back to them and seeing are you are you open to having this discussion are you open-minded and you've learned some some things that are incorrect perhaps or 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 do you just is it just belief because if it's belief forget it you, you can't take belief away from people they believe stuff uh, and that's a very hard thing to change but I think we have to be open-minded ourselves in that interaction. Selves. In that interaction, and it's very easy for people to slip into the "let me tell you, yeah, how wise I am and how I know all of the things, and you don't." And I'm I'm so sorry that you are so stupid and you don't understand these things. Um, but it's very important to you to keep in mind the possibility that you can be wrong, even even in spirit. I mean, even if you don't end up being wrong in that conversation. There may be another conversation where you are, but it, uh, it allows you to actually listen more effectively. I forgot to say what the name of the film was, but it's right between your ears. Uh, right. .com is the name of the film. Hello. Well, the thing Hello. I was going to say, the, the thing, exactly the, the tribalism is exactly the point that Tamsin was making. And, and the way around that, actually, I would say is to walk away from that particular argument and just become a human being. And you, the thing you have to remember that people quite often forget is that other people... Like what, if you really ask the question, what is an idiot? People are like, oh, there's a load of idiots over there. What is the definition of an idiot? And fundamentally, what most people mean is just someone who disagrees with them. But those are human beings who care about their families, who want to stay alive and have enough food and have enough money to get by and have respect for, you know, you know, want people to have respect for them. And and sometimes I think the best thing you can do uh, is is just to start at those things, you know, talk about their family, talk about their kids being at school, move the conversation onto those things. So you establish to each other that you're human beings and that you do have very fundamental things in common. And, and you know, sometimes then, uh, you know, the way things go lets you, it might let you suggest something that they hadn't thought of, you know, perhaps not using loads of pesticides in your back garden might be healthy for you. I don't, I don't, there might be something like that, but, it, but the most important thing is to be a human being. Remember that they are a human being as well. And we know it's hard, right? We know, especially scientists, look at people, you know, and um, it's just the most obvious category, right? Climate science deniers. It's absolutely motivated reasoning, but they are still human beings. And you have to start from them being a human being. And it is really hard. And you also have to accept that... Um, it's not so science science 
is a very important method for establishing how the world works. But it's not a cultural tool. And you have to accept that you're part of a culture. So I'm not saying that you should, you know, suddenly think that science is wrong. Science is a method. It's not a thing that is wrong. But you have to be human. If you don't have those debates as a human being, you're never going to convince her. And actually, Tamsin did this for years. She didn't, she was, modest and didn't mention it, but she used to have tea with climate skeptics. And I do not have the patience to do that. To this day, I, I am so, I was always so impressed. But she sat down with them and talked to them. Um, and, you know, they didn't always agree with her in the end, but they they accepted she was a human being, that she wasn't the great evil over there who was a monster. And mm. that's the start. Hippie. Um, so, uh, the, uh, yeah, there's a, uh, um, but to tell me this then, Helen, if you've done all this research, right? Okay. How come it is that if someone has in their uh, profile, loving husband, great dad, loving yeah. husband, great dad, they are far more likely to tweet like an asshole. Anyway, there we are. That's just a little thing there. Um, just stomped all over our uh, wonderful and careful. <laughs> of course, that's my job. No, I do agree. I, I mean, what I really would say is, as, as Helen was saying, that, that bit in person, you can waste a lot of time arguing on the internet. And unless you're really getting a kick from it, if you haven't got so, because there are ways of getting to people, there are ways of communicating with people. And I personally feel that social media is predominantly uh, a negative space for trying to convince people of uh, other options of kind of ways of thinking yeah, and that and that gotcha thing is really you've got to question how much are you doing it to change their mind and how much are you doing to it to look good to win the argument there's a lot of people out there just doing it to to be the one that wins the argument and look good I, I would suggest staying in and meeting no one. I've been increasingly using that. Originally, I had uh, the basic alibi of uh, of the lockdown, but I'm going to keep to that, and eventually I'll be found buried under my own books. Thanks very much. Uh, not ones I've written, just ones I own. I'm not expecting I, mean, I, I might just type away as well, like some crazy Jack Nicholson figure from The Shining. Uh, thank you very much to, uh, to Kerry and Tamsin and Helen. I will see you next weekend uh, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And don't forget also that, uh, as I mentioned before, Helen's serious that she did with Jim. Uh, on Cosmic Shambles uh, that is uh, the final episode coming up of that as well and uh, do go and watch Josie tonight as well uh, I'm doing a live stream of her wonderful show Tender and if you can't watch it this Sunday she's generally doing it most Sunday nights and it really is uh, worth your time and uh, yeah if you've got questions during the week please do send us more questions uh, obviously sometimes we'll hold them back for other weeks when we have uh, specific experts in specific areas um, but I hope you all enjoy your weeks continue Continue to uh, be careful, continue to take the best advice possible or find out where that is. Thanks. Bye-bye.